Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the lead. I'm Jake Tapper. An alleged terrorist is in a hospital bed in Newark, New Jersey right now. But we're learning this afternoon the two years before he allegedly planted multiple bombs in New Jersey and New York, his father called his son a terrorist. It's a statement a law enforcement source tells CNN the dad ultimately recanted. His father telling reporters today that this all followed an incident where Rahami stabbed his own brother after returning from an extended trip to Pakistan and Afghanistan. Let's get right to CNN's Jim Shooter. He's in Manhattan at the scene of the explosion Saturday night, which injured 29 people. And, and Jim, the FBI heard that Rahami's father had called him a terrorist. What happened after that? It, well, the FBI released a statement just a short time ago. This is what they say. They, they say that they made an assessment. They did multiple interviews. Uh, they checked their databases for any evidence of terrorist ties. They talked to other law enforcement agencies. And then they made a conclusion that he had no terrorist ties at that time in 2014. These are difficult judgment calls. Of course, two years later, we saw what happened just here over my shoulder, an attempted attack here in New York and in New Jersey as well. Tonight, U.S. officials tell CNN that the FBI interviewed the father of Ahmed Rahami in 2014 after a violent domestic dispute. This led to a tip alleging the father was calling his son a terrorist. After the father then downplayed the accusation, the FBI ultimately concluded it was a domestic matter. Today, Rahami's father told CNN more about the violent altercation. Now he say he's a terrorist. I say, okay. Why did you call the FBI two years ago? Because what uh, happened? He, he, he doing bad. He doing bad? What did yeah, he do bad? He, he, he stabbed my son. He, he hit my wife. And I put him in the jail uh, two years ago. Investigators are now attempting to question Ahmed Rahami, though police say he still isn't talking. One urgent question, did he have help in carrying out the alleged attacks? Do you still believe that he acted alone with these attacks and attempted attacks? Well, Jim, it's very early on in the investigation, so as we move through this, we're going to determine, you know, who is our acquaintance to our family, friends, go through his social media, uh, see if you had any phones. We'll go through all that to make that determination. Let's go! Get off the street! Pointing to possible inspiration for the attacks, a notebook that Rahami was carrying when captured referenced American AQAP leader Anwar al-Awlaki, killed in 2011 by a U.S. drone strike. It also contained references to the Boston Marathon bombers. Investigators are also scrutinizing Rahami's travels to Afghanistan and Pakistan, where he married and had a child and spent time in areas with a heavy Taliban presence. This to determine if he was radicalized overseas. The Afghan Taliban has denied any involvement in the bombings. The officials are trying to determine uh, if he had help in this endeavor. It would have taken some time to, to get all the materials to put these bombs together. The devices were made with easy to obtain ingredients and with recipes that are accessible online. But those materials, considered by experts to be a high explosive, had a potential explosive power bigger than what was seen in the Boston Marathon bombings. Jake, when I spoke to the New York Police Department commissioner today, he made very clear this is an ongoing investigation. They have not eliminated the possibility that there were others in Rahami's support network. They don't have an answer to that question now. Just one final thought. Here I am on 23rd Street, a few yards from where the bombing took place. It is hustling and bustling. It's been the same these last uh, 24, 48, 72 hours. Uh, being here, Jake, and particularly as a New Yorker, you do not get a sense of a city that is on edge or is nervous. They are handling this very bravely, as always. Jake? New Yorker is made of sturdy stuff. Jim Chito, thanks so much. CNN Justice correspondent Pamela Brown is here with me in Washington. She's been looking into the background of this alleged terrorist. And Pamela, we learned today that this man's wife left the country before the attack. A U.S. official told CNN uh, that she is cooperating. Do they think that she was involved in any way, aware of her husband's alleged plans? At this point, we're being told by U.S. officials that she's not being accused of any wrongdoing, that there's no indication at this early stage in the investigation that she had prior knowledge of her husband's plans or was involved in the plot in any way. Uh, she is Pakistani. She apparently had come to the United States and then went back to Pakistan on a trip recently. Uh, we're told by U.S. officials that she was making her way uh, back to the United States and then was questioned in the United Arab Emirates 
Emirates after it became clear her husband was the bombing suspect. And we are told by U.S. officials that she is cooperating and that she is still in the area. She did not make it to the United States. Jake, they married in 2011 in Pakistan. Um, a few years later, we've learned that the, the suspect here contacted a U.S. congressman's office asking for help getting his wife to the United States. She pe- became pregnant. That created some complications. Eventually, we're told she did make it to the United States. But again, she has not been accused of any wrongdoing. The alleged terrorists travel to Afghanistan mm-hmm. and to Pakistan. What are officials looking for there? Obviously, possible radicalization. That's right, because he traveled to places considered Taliban strongholds in Quetta, Pakistan. He also uh, traveled to Kandahar, Afghanistan. Now, he has family in that area. He spent a year there um, from 2013 to 2014. He also went there in 2011 for some time. And when he came back, he actually went through secondary questioning. He was a naturalized U.S. citizen, but they questioned him considering where he visited and he claimed he was visiting his wife aunts and uncles and he passed the screening without raising any red flags jake without being put on any terror databases but of course officials are going back to see if something was missed given what is unfolded there's got to be a lot of second guessing going on right now at the fbi with the they didn't interview him right. even though the father had said that he was a terrorist right they interviewed the father uh and other people according to the statement but they never interviewed him now at the time he was in jail and so they're saying that that was part of the reason why they didn't interview him. But given the fact of the accusations and what has happened two years later, I think there's definitely some second guessing. Right. FBI can be right a thousand times and wrong once. Yeah. It's uh, horrible for them. Pamela Brown, thank you. I want to bring in former Republican presidential candidate, Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky. He's on the Senate Homeland Security Committee along with the Foreign Relations Committee. Senator, thanks for joining us. Rahami's own father says that he referred to his son as a terrorist two years ago. We know Rahami went to Kandahar, Afghanistan. CNN sources also say he traveled to Quetta, Pakistan, the headquarters for the Afghan Taliban in 2011, uh, and then had traveled there again in 2013. And he stayed for almost a year. Do you see this as of right now as a possible intelligence failure? Possible. Yeah, I, I have a couple of questions. All right, you stab somebody and you're not in jail. He stabbed somebody and it sounds like beat up his mother as well, and he's not in jail. How long did he spend in jail? But the other question I have, and this is a more troubling question, almost every major attack we've had on our in our country has been previously investigated by the FBI, and the FBI closes the investigation. So I've been going around and around with the FBI on this because when the Orlando killer was investigated, they closed the investigated prematurely saying, We did not deem him to be a credible threat. I even asked them, in retrospect, did you make a mistake? They're like, oh, no, no. Given the facts, we made the correct decision. Well, no, they didn't. They made a bad decision. Once again, they made a bad decision here. The Boston bombers, they interviewed them in advance. 9-11, we even captured one of the hijackers in advance. We're not doing a good enough job of pursuing our leads. If your dad says you're a terrorist, why don't we then subpoena, monitor, get a warrant, find out his travel schedule? If he's gone to Pakistan, why don't we inquire where he went? All of this should have been done on the heels of someone accusing him of terrorism. So I really think the FBI needs to do a better job. Rahami went through secondary screening each time he traveled abroad. Yet he satisfied whatever concerns immigration officials might have had. Uh, A lot of people are saying that that screening is insufficient. What more can be done? What more should be done? Well, I think we have to ask more deeper questions, but we also have to know who they talk to, and we need to alert the authorities when they're, you know, if someone's been accused of terrorism in our country, we should be alerting Pakistan, and Pakistan should probably have surveillance on them when they get there. The Boston bombers, we should have known where the Boston bombers were going and we should have followed them. We did nothing to monitor their travel after the Russians tipped us off. Now, the FBI will respond, oh, we didn't have probable cause. But this shows a misunderstanding of probable cause. Probable cause is something that you beseech the court and you ask the court their opinion on it. There are standards for it, but until they're turning you down repeatedly, you aren't asking enough. 99% of the time when they go to the special court, they get a warrant. I think they need to go more often. And what we have, the debate we have in Washington is instead of digging deeper into suspect history, they want to look at everybody's information. I don't want every American's information to be under the purview of the FBI, but I do want the FBI to do a deeper search and a search with a warrant into people for whom we have suspicion. Republican nominee uh, Donald Trump uh, has been calling for profiling. Now, when he's been told that it, it sounds like he's calling for religious 
or racial profiling that he says, no, I just want to leave it up to the experts. But he does talk about how somebody looks and how police uh, uh, are, are too worried and too politically correct these days to ask the right questions. Is there any kind of profiling that needs to happen? Obviously, there's criminal profiling, a separate thing that needs to happen that, that law enforcement is not doing that would make us safer. I think people misunderstand the debate about profiling. If we have an individual for whom we have suspicion, there should be a profile of activities that we look at based on the suspicion. But we shouldn't look at all Arab Americans. We shouldn't look at all Muslim Americans. But if we have a person who then has several of the criteria that seem to be consistent with terrorism, and we have suspicion for that individual, by all means, we should go down the rabbit hole looking until we find out whether they are or not. But we shouldn't just sort of simply say, well, most terrorists are Muslim American, therefore we're going to look at all the data of Muslim Americans. But we go even one step further. We don't even look at just all the data of people who might fit a profile. We want to look at everyone's data, or the government does. So I think we should individualize the suspicion, but we shouldn't be stymied and say, oh, well, probably not a terrorist. We should look long and hard and explore all of their contacts. So I don't think we are doing enough to investigate individual suspects. And and instead, we're wanting to look at everyone's information indiscriminately, and I think that's a privacy violation. The Senate's going to vote on a resolution of disapproval that you're offering. Uh, it, it is disapproving of a $1.15 billion weapon sale by the United States to Saudi Arabia, which is obviously involved in this war in Yemen. Why do you want to block this weapon sale? The Constitution gave the power to initiate or declare war to Congress. We are now at war in Yemen, in a way. We are refueling Saudi, Ara Saudi Arabian bombers in the air, and we are picking their targets. That sounds to me like we're involved in a war, and yet no one has consulted Congress or asked our permission. So the vote tomorrow, in a way, is a vote on whether or not we should be at war with Saudi Arabia in Yemen. But it's also a vote on whether we should continue to sell them arms. President Obama has sold more arms to Saudi Arabia than all the rest of the presidents combined. He sold $100 billion worth of arms to them. So on the one hand, President Obama has released money to Iran to buy weapons. And on the other hand, he's giving money to Saudi Arabia. To me, it sounds like an arms race where we're funding both sides of every, every skirmish over there. And in the ensuing chaos, Saudi Arabia does nothing to help. I mean, are they taking any refugees from Yemen? Are they taking any refugees from Syria? No, they stir up the fight on both sides. Their money and their weapons flow in, and then they look the other way at the humanitarian nightmare that is Yemen and Syria. All right, Senator Rand Paul, thank you so much. Appreciate thank it. You. Be sure to tune in next week to a special CNN town hall event with President Obama at the Fort Lee Army Post in Virginia. It's a critical time for our men and women in the armed forces for security here at home for the United States leadership abroad. President Obama will answer crucial questions posed to him by active servicemen and women, veterans, their families. It's all at 9 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday the 28th. Tune in.